Good morning. Again, sorry about all of that. I'm Yvonne Benny Basque, and I'm pleased to welcome to you to Vermont Archaeological Society's virtual presentation for Vermont Archaeology Month. I'm quite pleased today to introduce to this morning's speaker, Steve Butts. Steve is an educator, writer, archaeologist, and environmental scientist who's taught at the secondary and college level for over 20 years. Steve attended Cornell and has published numerous books, including on the subject of today's presentation. Steve is currently at SUNY Albany researching the material culture of refugee settlements. Today's talk titled Update on the Shays Settlement Site in Sandgate, Vermont, will give us a general overview of the Shays Settlement Project. This is an archaeological study of the historic ruins of an 18th century settlement located in the mountains of southern Vermont. Steve will give, be giving us an update on the work on the online artifact image library, the LIDAR study, and recent excavations at McGee's Cabin. Please join me in welcoming Steve Butts. Well, thank you, Yvonne. Um, and I'd like to thank the Society for in, uh, inviting me to speak about the Shays Settlement Project today. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen and uh, get this presentation going. Um, okay. So here we go. Now I'm hoping if this will go into full screen mode. So, all right, does everyone see that? Be good to go? Looks I can't good. hear anyone, but I'm assuming you can see this. So. Looks great, Steve. Okay, it looks good. All right, um, so, um, so I am Steve Butts and I am the uh, project leader for the Shea Settlement Project. Um, so basically to give you an overview of what the project is, um, it's the first formal study of the settlement founded by Captain Daniel Shays and uh, his fellow refugees uh, in 1787 after they were um, fleeing uh, persecution in Massachusetts. Um, incredibly, the site has remained isolated for over 200 years um, in the mountains of Vermont. The archaeological and historic investigation uh, formally began in 2013, although I've been researching the site for, for longer than that. Um, and really, uh, one of the most exciting aspects of the project is that it has um, uh, been doing a lot of public outreach. And uh, since 2014, we've had uh, over 120 students in grades 9 through 12 participating um, in uh, archaeology field schools uh, um, that we've been conducting in conjunction with Cambridge Central School um, over the summer. And uh, that's really been a, a pretty, pretty awesome aspect of this project. Um, what I'm going to talk about today, I will give a quick overview of the project if you're not familiar with it and um, some of the sites that make it up. Um, but the updates that I really want to focus in on today uh, include the online image artifact library that we just put online this summer. Um, we did an excavation um, this summer also, uh, which is very interesting. It was, uh, you know, in the the time of COVID-19, so it was very challenging in that regard, but it was um, it did yield some results. Uh, we also um, have been looking at the LIDAR study that Vermont has released uh, from Bennington County and how that was applied to the project. Um, I will talk a little bit about my own research that I'm doing at SUNY Albany for my PhD program and uh, uh, the discussion of the long-term site preservation and possible state and historic uh, recognition that we're seeking in the future. So. So to get started, really, for me, this project began with this uh, site, which I um, was originally introduced to back in 1997. Um, but uh, it was described to me as the fort that was uh, built by Daniel Shays um, during Shays' Rebellion, and it was located on Egg Mountain in Sandgate, Vermont. Uh, I hiked up there. It happened to be in the winter, and there it was. There was this structure there. And from that day forward, really, uh, it began a long investigation of what this was all about because I couldn't understand how a fort would have been constructed in Vermont during Shays' Rebellion, which actually took place in Massachusetts anyway. Why would there have been a fort in such a remote place in Vermont? Could it have been connected to Daniel Shays? And, and that really is how the project uh, began. Um, so where we're talking about here, the, uh, the site location is right here in Sandgate, Vermont. Um, so it's southwestern Vermont. Uh, just over the border uh, from Salem, New York. Um, the land uh, is very, very mountainous. This is a picture looking uh, east. This is actually the town of Salem here. And then Egg Mountain, where the study area is, is the highest mountain in the, in the background. 
um, which is pretty amazing for the location of this settlement. And most of the, the settlement is located right here on the southwestern shoulder of Egg Mountain. Um, and if you look up closer, you can see this flat area here at the base of Egg Mountain is basically where the settlement exists. The land is part of a 2,300 acre privately owned forest tract um, called the Coe Tract. Um, when I first began the project, it was owned by the Forest Land Group and then they sold it during the study to the Conservation Fund. Um, both of the uh, Conservation Fund and the um, uh, Forest Land Group have been great partners with the project um, and they are willing to go forward with any type of preservation long-term. Um, and they've been and they've been great in that regard. Uh, so it is um, protected land, um, and it has been sustainably managed. So what really began as the question of whether this site was a fort and was it related to uh, Daniel Shays uh, started here. And this is a map of the the settlement as it appears today. Um, and the fort location right here, you can see that's where the study began. And when I went up there and I had permission and I had site access license from the landowners to begin the project, uh, I started canvassing the area and trying to figure out were there any other structures beside the fort. And lo and behold, much to my surprise, uh, over the years, we not only found the fort, but we have found an entire 18th century settlement that is basically a time capsule of life from the, uh, the early 18th century and uh, hoping that it was in some way um, connected to Daniel Shays. So the property, although there's about 2,300 acres total of the land, the Shays settlement um, is, takes up about 300 uh, acres. Um, and you can see it right here. Uh, for those of you that don't know who Captain Daniel Shays is, I'll give you a quick overview. Um, he was a Revolutionary War hero. He was a captain in the Continental Army. Uh, he served in many famous battles from Bunker Hill to Stony Point to Saratoga, um, and he was well regarded by um, all the leaders at the time, including George Washington actually knew who Daniel Shays was. So he was, certainly was a Revolutionary War hero. Uh, but when he came back from the war um, in the late uh, 1780s, um, there was a post-war debt crisis that was undergoing, uh, especially in Western Massachusetts. And uh, I could spend an hour or two just talking about the economic crisis and all of the factors that led to the rebellion. But in short, I can just tell you that Daniel Shays became the de facto leader of a group of disgruntled um, farmers who were rebelling against the system and the, uh, the class war that, that resulted. Um, and the only real known uh, image that we have of Daniel Shays is this woodcut here from a newspaper uh, from 1787, and that is as Daniel Shays, um, of course, pictured as the military leader that he was. Now, the rebellion um, did affect the whole state of Massachusetts, even though it really was mostly in the West. Daniel Shays um, and his uh, fellow veterans formed a militia called the Regulators, and they shut down the court systems all throughout the state of Massachusetts because of the unfair practices of throwing their farmers, fellow farmers, in the debtor's prison um, and other. Uh, what they felt was unfair practices by the Massachusetts government. This eventually led to a revolt, a revolt, an armed revolt led by Daniel Shays and his regulators, and culminating in uh, an attack on the uh, Springfield Armory in Massachusetts. But specifically related to Vermont history, what I think is fascinating is when the regulators were forming their militia, which got to about 1,500 um, soldiers, uh, they actually reached out to Ethan Allen. Um, who at the time was still in the Bennington area. Um, and they offered him the command of the regulator army because they knew that Ethan Allen, of course, had his famous um, land wars with neighboring New York and thought he would have been a great leader. Uh, but as you can see in his quote by his brother that uh, he refused to be involved with the uh, insurrection in Massachusetts as he called. And actually um, Ethan Allen also plays back into this story a little bit later. So what happened to the regulators? They attacked the Springfield Armory in Massachusetts. It was repulsed by the Massachusetts militia. Uh, four regulators were actually killed and then they retreated. And they were on the run because the Massachusetts militia was charged with apprehending all the regulators, especially the leaders who were wanted for treason. And if they were captured, they would have been hung for their crimes. So eventually they made it through to Vermont. Um, so the timeline that I've put together 
uh, briefly of, of the movements of, of the regulators is that in February, um, that's when they began to leave Massachusetts. The actual Springfield encounter took place in January of 1787. Uh, in March of 1787, there was dispatches that regulator families were seen moving north into Vermont with all their possessions. So that's an interesting um, observation that also relates to the archeology span that we've been doing there. Uh, we know that in April of 1787, 100 or more regulators were in Shaftesbury, Vermont. So just north of Bennington and just south of Sandgate. So they were slowly moving up. And then in July of 1787, Daniel Shays and his right hand uh, commander, Adam, Captain Adam Wheeler, were seen in a public house or tavern in Arlington, Vermont, which is just uh, east of Sandgate. And they are on horseback, armed with swords and pistols. And that's an interesting observation in many regards. It definitely proves that he was there. Um, but also at that time, that was the capital of Vermont. Um, and Governor Chittenden was, his house was right in Arlington. So it would have been completely uh, strange for the governor of Vermont not to know that the colonies or former colonies most wanted criminal was in his town drinking at a tavern. So it kind of gives you an idea of how the Vermonters, and remember Vermont was not a state at that time, but certainly it was, it was uh, governed, um, that they were uh, sympathetic to Daniel Shays and, and his fellow refugees as they're fleeing uh, persecution. We also have um, the deed to the land. So I have done research in trying to trace the property ownership. And we know that in January of 1788, Daniel Shays purchases lots 52 and 56 in Sandgate, Vermont. Uh, these were original land grants from the Hampshire grants, actually, of Governor Wentworth. Um, and uh, the land that he had, these two lots, is about 470 acres, which actually is very close to the size of the acreage that we've identified the settlement is existing in now. We also know that Daniel Shays' sister lived in Salem, New York, which is right over the border from Sandgate. And many fellow officers that um, Daniel Shays served with in the army uh, lived in this area. So it seemed to be a welcome place for him. So we believe based on um, the records and all of the historical research that I've done that we can definitively say that Shays settlement was founded sometime in the winter of 1787. We're not sure exactly when they showed up there, um, but uh, and it did not only consist of this site known as the fort, but an entire uh, 18th century settlement, which is much uh, a big surprise because when I first got into this, I felt that, yeah, maybe this was a, maybe a temporary enclave. The Shazites, as they were known, uh, went up there, were hiding out until they, they figured out a way to get their freedom, and then they dispersed. But the archaeology that we've been doing there over the, over the past years has revealed a, a whole different story. So um, prior to this year, 2020, this is what the makeup of the settlement um, was. Uh, it consists of about um, 11 sites. Uh, major sites, of course, would include these uh, foundations, what we believe are for homes, although one of them might have also been a mill. Um, and uh, even though it, was, it has grown since that time in the past month or two, uh, it still shows a pretty uh, interesting arrangement of, of this 18th century, 18th century settlement organized up into um, this refugee colony uh, who are in hiding. So it all began really with the fort site. Uh, this is a beautiful area, uh, really, any time of year when you go up there, it's, uh, it's actually a, a very um, interesting place. The fort is about 100 by 100 feet square. Um, it does have a central building. Uh, once we started uh, cleaning it out and started surveying and mapping it, we discovered that there was a central foundation within the fort. Uh, it overlooks the central road. There's, you can see the central foundation. And it's interesting because when you, when you look at the fort, um, you can see that um, one side of it is heavily built up. That's the side that faces over the road. It's, it's obviously fortified. And then the back of the fort almost looks like it was either hastily built or never actually finished, um, which is interesting. And we, um, uh, and I'll give you a fort flyover. This is what we did for, let's see if this plays, yeah. So we, uh, we took a drone up there and tried to get a, uh, a good shot of, of the, what the fort looks like. Uh, and it still has to be definitively proven if it actually is a fort. All right, now. Um, what's really fascinating uh, is 
in my historical research, uh, I have been looking at Major Royal Tyler, who actually has become a famous Vermonter. At the time, though, he was uh, serving as a major in the Massachusetts militia, and his um, job was to apprehend Daniel Shea. So he went actually with troops into Vermont, into Bennington, to try to work with the Vermont, Vermont government to see if they could help them apprehend the criminals. Um, and his uh, papers are actually in the Vermont Historical Society collections, um, which is amazing. And he uh, documents um, everything that happened during that time. And we know from his own words that he actually arrested Adam Wheeler somewhere in the Sandgate area. And he was taken by sleigh with the, Ma uh, the Massachusetts militia. They were trying to return him back to Bennington, but then a skirmish broke out between the Shazites and the militia, and he was actually freed. So we know from his own words that there were definitely, um, there was a skirmish of some sort, so a, a mini battle. And uh, so, you know, that points to the possibility that that structure up there uh, might have actually been designed as a fortification because the Shazites were in hiding. They know they were wanted for their crimes. If they were arrested, they would have been brought back to Boston for trial and probably hung. Um, so I think that the idea of that being a defensive structure is not too outlandish. And we have uh, Major Tyler's own words. Um, and I'm still researching those letters because there's a lot more information to be gleaned from them. But it kind of gives you a fascinating mindset of uh, what the Shazite were facing and, and why they would have been hiding because uh, they were basically protecting their livelihood. We also know that Ethan Allen knew about the settlement because he was approached by Major Tyler who was trying to say, hey, look, can you help us out and get these guys out of the woods and we can, we can arrest them? And uh, he famously said, I don't think it worthwhile to prevent them that had fled into the state for shelter from cutting down our own maple trees. So that's Ethan Allen's response to Major Tyler. Um, and he, uh, <laughs> yeah, no offense to any people from Massachusetts, but um, he viewed the Massachusetts government as a pack of damn rascals. So uh, interesting uh, that he was involved. And this was when, um, uh, just before Ethan Allen moved up to Burlington. So he was still in the area and knew exactly what was going on with the creation of this hidden settlement. So um, from the fort site, when you go down and this line here on the topographic map is the logging road that exists today. And we believe it's the same road that has been there since the settlement was founded in 1787. Um, down from the fort is the mill site. Um, we believe this is a mill because of historical references to it being a mill site. Also, the nature of the layout of the buildings and uh, the, the, the creation of a mill pond to provide water power, um, the discovery of a spillway. Um, and this actually is really an interesting site. It, sends to, it seems like this was the center of activity for much of the settlement. The map here that we've created involves the mill building itself. There's a spillway. We have either a cistern or a privy that is here. And then there's a long foundation for a very long building. We're not even sure exactly what that was as there's, there has been no excavations done there. And then we've located the mill dam and mill pond, which powered the mill through a um, raceway that would have connected them. And we believe we found the evidence of how that was uh, constructed as well. So this is a very rich site and an interesting part of the settlement considering they were there. And if it was actually a mill, it would indicate that they were um, there to you know, be self-sufficient. Uh, this also coincided with the uh, creation of the field school. So we began excavating at the mill um, in the summers of 2014, 15, and then 17. Uh, this is an easy site to get access to. Most of the sites there are very remote. Um, it's very difficult to get anyone up there um, without uh, four wheel drive vehicles. It's about two and a half miles from the nearest uh, road. So, um, but this one was pretty accessible. And so that's where we decided to begin our um, education program. And uh, since that time, we have educated students in all aspects of uh, modern archaeology, map making, surveying, artifact, uh, you know, classification. Um, and uh, it's been a very successful public outreach program and has gotten students involved in their own local history. Um, we've had students participate from New York, Vermont, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. So it has really uh, reached out uh, to a, a high population. And then finally, we got the uh, uh, Vermont uh, archaeologists involved. Uh, Jess Robinson and Yvonne were there um, beginning in 2018 to help with some uh, uh, excavations that we were doing. This one was actually a unique one. I'll talk about it a little bit uh, later, which was a root ball 
there was a tree that could blown up at the base of a site. So it gave us um, some uh, interesting vertical archaeology to, to, uh, to work on. And then, um, of course, the uh, artifacts that we have been finding from uh, the Mill Spillway uh, have been really revealing. Um, you know, I never knew exactly what we were going to find as far as occupation. Um, this land uh, has been um, lumber, it's been in lumber. Um, we know that there's been hunting clubs up there. So I really didn't know what to expect, but what was fascinating about the archeology span is that uh, we were discovering that it really represents, you know, the, the material culture of this very fine period of time between 1787 and, and around 1813. So it is virtually, uh, has been untouched. Uh, as far as we know, no one has been up there doing any type of excavation. Uh, or metal detecting, thankfully, and um, the artifacts are telling a very um, unique story about uh, what these people were going through and uh, how how it ended up in the in the long run. The presence of window glass is really fascinating. I'll talk more about that later. Uh, we also have been finding lots of evidence of burning at all the sites. Um, this especially is a good sample. This is a burnt timber from the mill site. Um, and it, this is the way it goes all across all the sites that we've been excavating that for some reason at the end of the settlement, it was actually burned to the ground. We don't know if it was a forest fire or if it was purposeful, purposeful burning, but the evidence of burning is quite clear at all the sites. So that was the mill site. Then we go down to the, uh, the tavern site down the road. Now, we don't know specifically if this was a tavern. Um, we came about the name because there is uh, historical references to there being a tavern there. Uh, it is located within the crossroads of the settlement, uh, has a very large storage cellar. Um, so we threw that out there, but it's obviously just uh, conjecture. Um, the tavern uh, has not been excavated uh, that much. We've done some test pits there, but it was the only site that was compromised by 20th century garbage uh, because of a hunting cabin that was built right nearby and they used it as their trash dump. So we had to remove lots of 20th century garbage before we got down to the 18th century layer. Uh, but you can see that obviously uh, similar period artifacts definitely connect that site to being uh, related to the other sites. And that was a crotal bell that we found there too. Now, uh, this past summer, 2020, um, this picture here is of McGee's cabin. So this is a hunting cabin built around 1900 by a logger who worked on the land uh, his name was Fremont McGee. He was from the Salem area. And uh, so because of the COVID, we couldn't do the field school this year, obviously with students and all that. But I did get some, I had three uh, volunteers from previous years who had already graduated and they decided that, you know, they would come up and we'd practice social distancing and doing all our protocols for trying to stay safe and disease free. Um, and we thought that we would try to see if McGee's cabin was built on a pre-existing 18th century foundation that was part of the settlement. Um, and that's what the excavations were this summer. So we only spent three days up there and we did some test pits along the sides of McGee's cabin. And we did find out that it actually was not. So McGee's cabin was not built on a pre-existing settlement. There is no evidence of 18th century occupation or the presence of a foundation uh, underneath McGee's cabin that dates from that time. Um, which is interesting because uh, I'd always wondered why this cabin was built near the tavern, but not right on the old foundation of the tavern. So I don't know if they still were spooked by the, uh, the ghosts from the haunted settlement or why McGee decided not to build on a, on a pre-existing foundation, but that was uh, um, what we accomplished, what small gains we accomplished uh, this summer. So it was good that we kept the continuity going and, and um, you know, uh, learning still more about the settlement. So that was the tavern site. Um, next site down from there is called the Center Chimney House. Very large structure with a center chimney, dry laid stone. Um, we believe that this is actually the doorstep to the entrance of the house uh, with a small root cellar. Um, again, you know, when we started this project, we were focusing on the fort and then we realized that there was a lot of other structures up there, but that didn't mean that they were all built at the same time. I mean, this represents 200 years of Vermont history. These cabins could have been built at different times, occupied by different people. Um, and we wanted to definitively prove or disprove the fact that this was a cohesive settlement that 
was built by the Shazites at one time. So of course, archeology span is very helpful in that regard. So some of the artifacts that we've uh, unearthed there tell the story of cohesiveness. If you see that as we go through this, you'll find that there are very common ceramic types um, that were used by these people and you know, definitively proving that um, all the sites there were built at the same time by the Shazites, which is a pretty exciting discovery. Um, this was an interesting find at the center chimney house right here. This is a military button from the War of 1812, uh, a New York militia. So we know that whoever lived or visited the center, center chimney house uh, most likely uh, was a participant in the War of 1812. And um, that stretches out the occupation time uh, for over 20 years. So not only was this settlement built by the Shazites, but it was inhabited for at least 20 years, um, showing that uh, it was a long-term resettl resettlement project. That's the center chimney house um, located down the creek. And you can see actually most of these sites are built right on water, which makes sense. Um, but down the creek from there is a smaller site called Foundation 4. Uh, no real excavations have been done here. We cleaned the site, we've mapped it, but we don't really know what it was. We have found no evidence of uh, there being a chimney, um, but you know that doesn't mean that there wasn't any kind of hearth there. Was it a storage uh, house? We're not sure. We still have a lot of work to be done up at the site, obviously, to figure out what the real story is, but this is a fascinating site, Foundation 4. We move down here to Foundation 2. Um, this is a small cabin that was built right next to a creek. There's a creek that runs along it. They built an abutment wall, so they put it right on the creek, which is pretty fascinating in itself that they went through that effort. Why they did that, um, we're not sure. Um, this is the way the site looks, and you can see the massive abutment that they built next to the creek. There's a small cellar, and there's a dry laid chimney. So this was a small dwelling. Test pits uh, that were conducted there revealed that you know, it obviously was um, occupied by the same people at the same time. So the similar ceramic patterns that we're seeing. Just up the hill from foundation two is foundation three, um, another dwelling. And um, this one had a small side entrance to a pretty large uh, root cellar, a very large uh, dry laid field stone chimney. And what's fascinating about this is you can actually see here on the left that the chimney collapsed in mass. You know, it was laid up and then bam, it just collapsed. Um, when it collapsed, we believe is probably like the others is like I mentioned earlier, we're finding evidence that these sites were all purposely burned. They seem that they, they were torched, uh, which might've had something to do with the epidemic that could have ended the settlement in 1813. Uh, but this is unique that you can see that the actual chimney just fell in, in one big, big collapsing event. Um, the artifacts that we've done from our test pits here tell a similar story as the others, very similar patterns. Um, and of course, window glass again, which is, which is fascinating. Some of the other artifacts, including a, an agricultural hoe. Um, and uh, in 2018, this uh, privy was discovered, which is next to foundation three. So um, we did a bit of uh, excavation in the privy to see if we could find any evidence of uh, what was going on in there. And you can see obviously that there was definitely some 18th century or early 19th century artifacts. Then the settlement actually um, to that point, um, that's what we believed uh, composed the entire settlement. Uh, and, it, and we had been working up there for about three years. We had uh, run two field schools. And then I got a phone call from a local person who read about the study in the paper and said, hey, um, you better be careful up there because you're gonna, you and your students are all going to get the plague. And um, also, by the way, uh, where you're digging and doing your work, you're, you're, there's, you're not even near Daniel Shea's house. So I said, whoa, wait a minute. Um, you." First of all, uh, we're thank you for the warning about the plague, but we're we, we've been healthy. Um, <laughs> but um, what's the deal with Daniel Shea's house? He goes, yeah, yeah, you're you're not anywhere near Daniel Shea's house. And I said, you actually know where Daniel Shea's lived on the mountain? And he said, yes, I grew up. Uh, my family owned the land. Blah blah blah. And I said, well, let's. I'll get. We'll go in the jeep. I'll pick you up. Why don't you show me around? He says, no, I don't have the time. And then he hung up the phone. 
So that was really um, kind of a crushing blow in a way, but then it got me to thinking like, what have I been missing? Is there anywhere else that there could be houses in this area? Um, so we extended our uh, search grid and lo and behold, we discovered foundation five, which seemed to be kind of an outlier over here. Um, so foundation five, we're calling possibly Daniel Shea's house uh, is really one of the, the best sites out of all because the main hearth is still intact. Uh, the, the site uh, has a really very nicely constructed cellar. Uh, the house actually had a back room. There are, there are outbuildings. So this site is really interesting because it seems to be one of the nicest constructed dwellings out of the settlement. But of course, we had no idea when it was constructed. It could have been 50 years after the Shazites were there. And that's what's so great about archaeology because we can go in, we could do some test pits and kind of figure out, well, when was this occupied? And so uh, the results of those um, test pits reveal the same ceramics at all the other sites. So now we know that this was definitely connected to the other sites. And um, what's even more intriguing about this is it seems that the person that lived here uh, has the nicest stuff, <laughs> so, so to speak. Um, this was the first example of a, um, an ivory handle utensil. Um, all the other sites have yielded utensils, but they tended to be bone handled. Um, this was one that was actually ivory. So there were some unique things about this, um, this site, and uh, we definitively don't know if it was Daniel Shea's house, but it certainly um, can be a possibility based on the array of artifacts and also the location. We also found a live stone in a utility uh, shed that was um, right next to Foundation 5, which is kind of an interesting site. Uh, this was a great discovery to make with students because when we unearthed it and we started figuring, oh, hey, there's grooves in this stone. And of course, when we finally unearthed it completely, uh, they thought it was a sacrificial stone. You know, they were all excited. This is where they did sacrifices. And it's like, no, no, this is where they made sodium hydroxide or lye. So that was, uh, that was kind of interesting. Um, and this was also the location of the uh, root ball archaeology that Yvonne and, and Jess uh, <laughs> participated in back in 2018. Um, right at the base of Foundation 5, a huge oak tree got blown over. And of course, with gravity, the way it brings everything down, we figured, you know, let's, let's see if we can pick through the root ball and, and discover some artifacts. And uh, lo and behold, that was a pretty exciting um, year, as you can see. There's some red wear. And uh, yeah, we did um, actually retrieve artifacts from the root ball. So that was kind of an interesting application of, of archaeology. And there's our crew. There's Jess and uh, Sally Mankin from the Conservation Fund who've been great partners on this project. Um, and across the road is uh, Foundation Six, a uh, utility building associated with Foundation Five. So that was basically the uh, makeup of the settlement until this year um, when the LIDAR was released uh, for Bennington County. So this is a, a section of the eastern portion of the uh, Shea settlement. So um, this, it's a big area to cover, but I tried to cover it in two blocks so you could see it. And um, you can see there's the fort, and it's actually quite visible in LIDAR. Um, and this not only revealed stone walls uh, associated with the settlement and, of course, our uh, cellar holes, but unique structures that we still have to investigate. So it's really helpful in identifying potential new targets uh, that might make up the settlement. And you can obviously see them here. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done um, to try and discern, well, what are these things and um, how are they related to the settlement? It actually even might help us to uh, determine the, the area of the agricultural fields that, that they were um, developing at the time. Um, and then what's more interesting about the LIDAR study is the western side. So here is Foundation 5, that's so-called Daniel Shea's house that I just showed, and Foundation 6 across it. But down this gully, the LIDAR revealed these targets that now uh, upon investigation this summer, using the data from the LIDAR and, you know, uh, pinpointing it, we found another foundation here, Foundation 7, and then another one down here, Foundation 8, and then another one here, Foundation 9. So we've added three new structures to the uh, scope of this settlement. 
Um, we also, and you can see here, there's agricultural stone walls that we didn't know that were there prior as well. Um, so the LIDAR has really been helpful in um, expanding the scope of this project. And we're very interested in finding out, uh, are these sites connected to the settlement or were they put in later by uh, inhabitants uh, after 1815, 1820, et cetera. Um, so that's um, something that we, we hope to determine in the future. So that's the update on the LIDAR. So this original settlement village um, expanded from this to this um, in the past two months, which is pretty exciting. So uh, we're still learning a lot about this unique place. Um, what's also interesting about it is its location. As you can see on the maps here, this is a very high elevation um, settlement. Um, part of my research uh, that I'm trying to work into this project is looking at um, the date ranges of settlements in Vermont at this time to see, you know, what are their elevations and how do they relate to this? Is this a, uh, an outlier in Vermont or, I mean, is it truly a hidden settlement or are there other high elevation um, settlements from this time period of the uh, late 18th century, early 19th century in Vermont? Um, so Shea's settlement has, has definitely um, grown in size and scope. Um, the other update that um, I accomplished this year was the Shea Settlement Artifact Image Library. So um, you can go to sheasettlement.org and um, you can click on um, the Artifact Image Library. And the way it's, I'll put it up here, uh, the way it's laid out is by um, artifacts. So you can click on the mill. Um, and each artifact that we have uh, unearthed as a result of our excavations uh, over the years have been cataloged. Um, so this is obviously important for research and understanding the, the nature of the refugees here. Uh, that's again, part of my work that I'm, I'm doing with SUNY Albany is trying to categorize these date ranges, figure out possible economic conditions that uh, they were exposed to. Um, and the, um, the database also includes um, listings here, uh, our inventory list too. Um, so it's pretty amazing because there's a, there's a, there's a big story to tell from, from these artifacts and, and it's, it's an incredible time capsule um, that we have. All right, let's go back to my Zoom. So that's the artifact image library. Uh-oh, there we go. Okay, um, and that's for all of the, uh, oops, oh boy. Sorry about that. That's all of the artifacts we get back to work, um, that we've unearthed so far at all the sites. Okay, um, current research. So um, artifact analysis that I mentioned, um, which is part of my uh, research into the material culture of refugees, uh, especially applied to Shea settlement, um, to see exactly what the economic conditions, the political makeup, what do the ceramics and artifacts tell us about this settlement, how long it was occupied, how it was organized. Um, we also are looking to um, excavate in the privy that's located at the tavern site. Years ago, we attempted to get a side trench into it, and we realized that this privy was extremely deep. These marks here are in what foot increments. So uh, it's in excess of 10 feet. And um, we ran out of time. So then the Forest Land Group, who was actually part of this study, uh, helped fund um, a shelter that we built to protect it. And it's basically been up there um, for about three years. And we are hoping that I can get some research funding um, through my SUNY uh, research to, to build a structure and actually do some privy excavations and finish this project and also um, uh, stabilize it for, for long-term future. Um, we're also interested in trying to see if we can do some test pits at Foundation 7 and 8 that I mentioned from the LIDAR study to see if we could prove that they were actually occupied at the same time by uh, Shazites. And, and that's gonna be very useful in understanding um, the population that existed at this unique place. So that's some of the current research I'm looking into. And um, that pretty much wraps up my, my overview. Um, like I said, you can go to shaysettlement.org, uh, the website, um, to access lots of information, not only the artifact image library, but we have uh, two years ago, my students created 360 degree panorama digital images of each site. Um, so you can actually click on a site and then rotate them around and get the 360 view. So that's kind of an interactive uh, map of the settlement. Um, and if anyone has any questions or uh, comments or any, 
you know, obviously there's my email that you can get in touch with me to, uh, to learn more about the project. Um, and from there, I will, um, I will open it for questions or comments. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. That was always a pleasure hearing about the updates there. It's always exciting to see what you're finding. Um, so we had two questions uh, from Linda Salomon. The first question um, was sort of addressed, but maybe if you could elaborate. Uh, any evidence telling us what was processed in the mill? Yeah, okay, that's a great question. Uh, we have no evidence. Um, you know, there is historical documentation that I have from loggers up there that said that the millstone was still in the mill when, uh, and this was dated in 1930 when uh, this was written. Um, so uh, we have not unearthed the millstone. We have not found it. Uh, you know, maybe someone took it and made it's part of a mailbox now, um, but we, we really don't. Um, the um, agricultural fields we know existed, but we have, we have no idea. One of the things that actually would be very interesting is two potential places where we could determine that um, is the mill pond, which we could, we're planning on possibly doing a core sample. And if we can analyze the pollen um, in the sediments at the base of the mill pond to get a, a picture of what the vegetative changes were during that time period. Um, another similar thing could also be done possibly in the privy. Um, if we are going to analyze, like I know people have talked to me about uh, looking at parasites also that might have been showing up in the privy. So um, the answer is no, we don't know definitively, uh, but we're hoping to find out. Awesome. Um, her second question, uh, it's sort of in the same vein there. Any evidence for what the people on the site were doing to survive and prosper since farming would not seem to have been an option? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and that's what we're trying to determine. Um, at first, when this project began, um, I had figured that it was a temporary enclave that was just set up. And because Daniel Shays eventually was pardoned and the rest of the Shaysites um, in late 1788. Um, and uh, so they were, they were no longer wanted for treason. So they could have left. Now, Daniel Shays didn't leave there until about 1790. So we know that he lived there for at least three years. Um, and the evidence that we're also seeing, like that button I'd mentioned earlier and other pieces of evidence are suggesting that it was occupied until about 1813. So, um, you know, we, we don't know what their involvement was, but the makeup of the settlement and the fact that they uh, were really, they must have been trading with their neighbors. Um, they had some sort of, of income. Um, there was lots of agriculture going on there because we found lots of agricultural implements, uh, sheep shears, for example, we found. So we know that they're raising sheep. Um, we know that there are also other animal bones associated. So they were practicing agriculture. Um, and it, it appears with the mill site, if that is indeed a mill, um, that they were trying to be self-sufficient as well. Um, so, but yes, a lot of, a lot of questions remain. Oh, thank you. Um, a question just came in. Have you found any evidence of a cemetery? Oh, yes. Okay. That's an excellent question. Uh, we have found um, a, what we believe is a mass burial. Um, we call it the standing stone grave. Um, it is a huge pile of rocks with a central marker on it. And um, we're pretty certain that it looks like a burial. Uh, we also um, know that from old loggers that I've tried to talk to that there was another cemetery and I actually found a postcard from 1900 that was made of the site that shows the cemetery on Egg Mountain. Uh, I have not been able to find it. I've been with the photograph trying to hold it up and compare it to sites where we've been in the background. I still have not been able to locate it, but there is rumored to be another cemetery up there. Um, and that might be linked to the ultimate demise of the settlement, which was probably an epidemic that occurred in 1813 that we know um, probably killed off uh, the surviving uh, Shazites that resided there. Thank you. Um, I myself had a question. I was hoping you could describe more of the, you said there's evidence of burning across the site. Um, is it related to the structures? Are you finding burnt artifacts? I was just hoping you could talk a little bit more about what evidence there was. Yes, uh, it comes in many forms. It does come in burnt ceramics for certain, um, and also just charcoal, like massive amounts of charcoal chunks and burnt wood. Uh, the best example, as I've shown in the, in the uh, presentation from the mill, where it's actually, that's a, a huge timber. Um, from the building itself that was burnt. 
Uh, so we have found uh, burnt ceramics and um, actually um, and, and burnt pieces of wood themselves. Um, and we've tried to correlate it to a forest fire. We've gone and um, tested areas where and there's there's no charcoal. So it seems like the, the, the buildings were, were burned. It might have had something to do with the epidemic. Um, the working theory is that the epidemic went through there. There was a lot of death. It was abandoned and maybe the surrounding town folks from Salem or Sandgate or Rupert, Vermont went up there and, and burnt the place down to eradicate the plague um, and uh, also eradicate the settlement. Because that's the one thing that's very really fascinating. Um, after around 1813, no, no one ever attempted to live there again. There was never any resettlement to that area. It fell back into forest land and logging and, and it laid up there. I mean, good for us because it was it has acted as a time capsule. but. Um, yeah, we're not sure about the, the the burning story, but there is a lot of, lot of evidence to support it. All right, thank you. Uh, we have another question here um, from Bob. It says, some of the brush handles look like carding tools used for wool processing on British sites. If they are, could it be evidence for a sheep slash wool industry? That's an excellent observation. And yes, um, that is very possible. Like I said, we have found sheep bones and we also have found sheep shears. So there definitely could have been a uh, wool production uh, there, uh, without a doubt. Awesome, thank you. We have another uh, question here. Do you have plans to conduct an oral history regarding the memories of plague and the settlement? Uh, yes, um, actually uh, last winter, I unearthed a letter that was written um, pertaining to the actual plague that of 1813. We, based on the artifacts, um, we suspected and the deed records that it, there was probably abandoned sometime around 1815 or so. Um, but this a letter called the uh, Bassett letter was written about the settlement uh, on the mountain as it was referred to. And they called it, well, actually the title of it was called Plague on the Mountain. Um, and that uh, we have names actually, that's where we've gotten a, a bunch of names from the settlement. And, and you know what, I have, to, I have that, here we go, yeah. I have that right here, oops, there. Um, some of the names, oh, am I, am I still sharing my screen? I just stopped sharing, didn't I? Let me- uh, let Nope, me, you're still sharing, we can still see it. We can see it. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, uh, we're trying to, a lot of people approach me and, and, and say, oh, you know, I think my relatives had something to do with that. Um, we know that Daniel Shays lived there. I mean, uh, Adam Wheeler, this is a list of the names of the, these were the leaders of the rebellion um, and presumably were the leaders of the, of the settlement as well. Um, and uh, Eli Parsons, Simeon Hazeltine, John Wilson, uh, Nehemiah Hewlett and William Harkness, we've, all of these guys have been traced to um, living in Massachusetts and were connected to the rebellion itself. And then as we get further on, we stretch into these names down here. Now these names came from uh, the deeds and also the letter I mentioned about the epidemic. We know that Chilean Merrill's, um, Salmon Brown and James Knapp all died in 1813 from the epidemic. Um, and uh, we also know, we believe that Salmon Brown because the brook that goes right by the center chimney house, uh, which is one of the sites on, on maps is called Brown Brook. And actually in an old deed, it's referred to as Widow Brown Brook. So we know pretty closely that probably Salmon Brown lived in the center chimney house. Uh, he's from Connecticut, so it's interesting. We don't know how, if he was involved in the actual rebellion and then ended up there, how he came there. Uh, but what's incredible is we know that him and his wife raised four kids in that one spot and they most likely lived there to around 1813. So it could have been Salmon Brown that actually also participated in the War of 1812 as a, as a militiaman. And that explains why the button was found at that place. Um, so we're trying to put together the history of the epidemic, but uh, we're getting some names and uh, also trying to correlate to that mass grave that um, we, we found called the Standing Stone Grave. Uh, was it the hasty grave of these three guys that died in 1813 and, and ultimately put an end to the settlement? Uh, that would obviously take some really heavy duty archeology span to you know, start to excavate into a, into a mass grave. That's, that's way above my pay grade, pay grade. But who knows, there might be other ways of, of determining what happened there. But yeah, we're, we're definitely getting a, an oral history, trying to put names and faces uh, to this unique place. 
Awesome, thank you. Um, a question from James, what disease was involved with the plague? Um, we believe it was uh, typhus, um, just from the descriptions and I've done research on, and actually there's a great book about the uh, epidemics of Vermont uh, written not, I think it was in the 1830s and it really describes town by town uh, of the, uh, the different epidemics that wiped through. And uh, one of them was, was typhus that might've been, they call it the black death or the plague, but th there certainly wasn't plague. Um, it was most likely ty typhus or dysentery uh, that, that was probably the so-called black death. Awesome, well, uh, we'll give them a second. If there's any more questions that roll in, please let us know. Um, again, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, thank um, you. Yeah, a few more moments here, no new questions. All right, well, again, thank you. Um, we appreciate taking the time this morning to chat with us. And uh, again, the email is available. If anyone has any questions to follow up with Steve, uh, thank you. Um, awesome, well, we hope you have a, a nice beginning of your fall and hopefully we'll get some more updates coming next year. Thank you so much.